On a, on a la chance d'accueillir deux chercheurs particulièrement pointus dans leur domaine, qui sont Jean-Michel Fritz de Femto ST et Nicolas Barbeau du L6. J'espère que vous allez prendre plaisir dans les deux présentations qu'ils vont faire. On a appelé cet après-midi l'après-midi Backscattering. Euh, sur la thématique de la transmission d'informations sans puissance, sans batterie euh, et potentiellement euh, avec euh, des débouchés euh, pour euh, encore un siècle à venir. Euh, donc, euh, je te laisse la parole et puis euh, je vous souhaite à tous euh, profiter de la présentation. Merci. Euh... Je vois le trop hein. So I'll switch, I'll switch to English to make sure that everyone can follow the, the, the presentation. So I'm Jean-Michel Fried from uh, Femto ST in Besançon. Uh, and actually part of my presentation today will be the work I did as a systems engineer with a private company called Senseor. I was an engineer with Senseor from 2005 until 2016 when I joined the uh, University of Franche-Comté as associate professor. Uh, and the objective of Sensor was uh, to develop passive wireless sensors using a technology that we are supposed to master well in Besançon, which is surface acoustic wave piezoelectric transducers. And my activity as a sensor, as a systems engineer, was to try to develop a complete system: the sensor, transduction mechanism, antenna, and radar system. And I will try to emphasize in this presentation that I think a complete system approach is necessary to match properly the, uh, the transducer with the electronics and the, and, and the antenna, of course. Uh, part of my presentation, especially the radar part, will involve some measurements I did when I was visiting scientists for three months at Oku University uh, in Professor Sato's uh, laboratory, where I learned uh, about uh, various uh, radar architectures and fem ST is hosting my uh, research activity uh, at the moment. So the outline of my presentation will first involve uh, what are the requirements for passive cooperative targets. So I'll try to introduce what are the objectives for making these sensors and uh, why we believe in Besançon that so device, surface acoustic wave device, acoustic devices are well suited to the task. Uh, having said that, I'll show you a bit of a historical background uh, based on, on some preliminary work, of course, uh, with the advent of radar systems after the Second World War. Uh, people had the idea of using Pascal signals and have introduced this as the basics of our radio frequency identifiers, RFID. Uh, and I'll show you why we believe that acoustic transducers are well suited for cooperative targets of radar systems. And I'll show you the various architectures depending on the uh, radar properties. I'll show some demonstration of uh, applications uh, that we did with Sensor very quickly to show you some of the industrial applications that we uh, tackled. And I'll show you one final presentation here, which is a mix between passive by static radar, which is similar to energy harvesting applied to passive cooperative targets. So that's, that's the outline of the presentation. So first of all, what are the requirements? What is the objective? We want to make passive wireless sensors. If a sensor is passive and wireless, it has no difference with uh, radar targets. You cannot differentiate basically a sensor from a radar target because all the environment will involve reflecting the incoming energy that is supposed to power the sensor and uh, the backscatter signal will be hidden in clutter because the sensor will be much smaller than the motor, the train, uh, the building, whatever uh, object we will locate the sensor in. So the first question is, how can I introduce a dedicated signature inside the sensor response that will differentiate the backscatter signal from the clutter? The environment is sending back, is reflecting back a clutter signal from the radar incoming signal. How can I make sure that the sensor signal can be separated from the clutter? Once I've decided how to design the sensor, I wish to know how can I add the sensing capability? How can I detect a measurement? We're not talking about RFID here. It's not just an identification. There is or there is no sensor. We wish to make some sensing capability. And finally, the usual is that the signal going from the emitter to the target back to the receiver of distance, because if you consider that the sensor is a point light target, you've got one over D squared times one over D squared and receiver decays as the square of a distance and the direct sensors so we need to get rid of the direct signal interference so these are the three challenges that we need to meet when we design a complete 
wireless passive measurement system. My presentation now. So first of all, a bit of historical background. Uh, usually when you talk about history, frequency identifiers, RFID, people will read 48, which uh, used the knowledge acquired during Second World War, where radar operators learned that they could detect what kind of target was being illuminated based on the backscattered signatures. So when a plane was flipping or uh, doing some maneuver or because some propeller of a plane was introducing some side lobes, uh, some, some uh, side bands on the radar signal, they could identify which target was being illuminated by the radar. And basically that was a preliminary aspect of a friend or foe detection, whether the incoming plane was a friend or foe uh, coming in. And what Stockman pro proposes in his uh, presentation is to say, let's try to take some corner reflector, some uh, right angle reflector that will uh, reflect back the incoming energy in the same direction as, uh, as the source. And let's introduce on purpose this kind of signature. And in the case of Stockman, what he says is, let's make each one of these rings of corner reflectors rotate at different speed. And if I look at the side lobes on my, on the side bands of my backside signal, I can identify the free rotation speeds of these free circles, rings of uh, corner reflectors, and I can detect uh, basically our radio frequency identification. And luckily enough, at the end of his, uh, of his paper, Stockman says, rather than just rotating the corner reflector, we might change the radio uh, cross section. So for example, we might put a membrane at the bottom, uh, at the, at the, uh, the deepest part of a corner reflector and modulate uh, the backscattered energy. That that's the conclusion of Stockman's paper. We might modulate using the corner reflector, the backside signal, which is exactly what three years previously uh, Leon Theremin had done when he introduced the demonstration that we have here, the, the American seal uh, that was next to the uh, American uh, ambassador in Moscow. Uh, in this system, uh, dielectric cavity is uh, connected to a membrane, a vibrating membrane when the uh, uh, ambassador was speaking, it would vibrate the membrane, would modulate the uh, impedance of the cavity resonator and would modulate the backside signal of the, uh, of the system. So basically, for, uh, following the Second World War, people had been developing this kind of backscattering systems um, and they were, they were based on the idea that at the time everything was linear. You were backscattering the signal, you were incoming energy and you were looking at the same frequency. So there was no linearity involved unlike radio frequency identifier, which rely heavily on uh, nonlinear nonlinearities, as we'll see further tomorrow morning. So uh, in these cases, we have these linear systems and our systems that we're going to develop in the Belençon will be based on the same uh, introductory system of linear uh, behavior. Now, if you look at, at more recently, uh, the spy agency in NSA, when the leaked uh, documents from uh, Edward Snowden were published, you will find uh, in 2000, still 2013, that uh, you still have these uh, surveilling uh, capability where you have these uh, uh, radio frequency identifier modulating the backside signal with some illumination system, one to two gigahertz. So apparently these systems were initially investigated to, uh, to the nail understand how a long term system was working and the NSA is still using this kind of, develop of development. So the backscattering systems are uh, still commonly used, or at least in the intelligence agencies. If we look more into civilian applications, here is an example of a bridge uh, uh, stress measurement. In this case, again, a sensor which is made of a dielectric cavity. The boundary condition, so the, the sensor is located here between the bridge and the pillar. And when a heavy load uh, changes the weight on the bridge, it will uh, change the boundary condition on the dielectric, uh, on the cavity resonator here, and it will change the uh, backside signal. In this presentation here, they will give a complete radio frequency system in addition to the sensor, again, because the two systems are uh, closely uh, tied together and have some close relationship between the sensor response and the electronic for measuring. So basically these are the systems I was looking at when we were looking at historical aspect of uh, um, radio frequency devices, backscattering radio frequency devices, and I was wondering why would you actually even bother putting these sensors? Because, okay, okay, here is a nice example, but you could very well put the sensor under the bridge, uh, run a couple of wires, and that would work as well, and most, in most, uh, most situations, that's what's going to be done. And one situation where you cannot run wires or cannot go back to uh, replace a battery is subsurface. If you bury a sensor 
in concrete or in a building or in the subsurface once you install a pipe, you will no longer be able to access the sensor unless you dig the sensor out, which is not very practical. And I was involved otherwise for completely unrelated activities in ground penetrating radar. So in a ground penetrating radar or GPR, you do the opposite. You have a radar opposite of classical radar. And usually in radar, you have an antenna that sends a signal into air and you detect moving targets or static targets in air. And in ground penetrating radar, you have a, a radar antenna that sends an electromagnetic wave into the ground, into the subsurface, and it will detect any kind of interface, whether a cavity, whether a change in dielectric permittivity, anything that reflects the electromagnetic wave. I was working on GPR uh, for mapping uh, glaciers in Arctic regions, and as, as I was looking at the literature, this author, uh, Christopher Allen from the University of Kansas, had investigated the idea of trying to combine subsurface measurements using ground penetrating radar with cooperative targets. CT over here means cooperative targets. And of course, I saw this paper much later after working on these on these sensors with Senseor, but I was really struck struck by seeing what he used as the criterion, and that's going to answer my first question: How can I differentiate the clutter or the subsurface reflections from a cooperative target signal? And what Christopher Allen says in his presentation is: If your clutter has a signal that decays as the fourth power of distance, then at a given depth you will have a signal level that drops below the receiver noise level. So you're sure that here you cannot detect a reflector because your noise level, your signal level is below the noise level. So if you can find a trick to delay the cooperative target system response beyond the delay that was the minimum detectable signal level from the target, then you're sure that it's this delay. You can only have a cooperative target signal and no clutters. So your signal to noise ratio will be excellent because you know that here you only have the minimum detectable signal level from the receiver and you're sure that there is no subsurface reflector that can send back enough power to have to be at, at the same delay than the cooperative target. And that's exactly what I'm going to show you later in, in the next slide. This is exactly the inspiration that uh, drove us to use cooperative sensors made of piezoelectric material. So in the case of Christopher Allen, what he wanted was to detect the orientation. He was interested in landslides. He wanted to know the orientation of the antenna as a function of, uh, um, of time, so for landslide detection. And what he shows is that he can detect the orientation of the antenna as a function of angle uh, remotely using his ground penetrating radar. Now, Christopher Allen is an electrical engineer. So how does he delay a signal over time? He puts a long uh, roll of wire. So if you want to delay by one, one microsecond, because you know that you the deepest clutter is one microsecond late, uh, a signal will propagate at 200 meter per microsecond in a coaxial cable. So if you put 100 meter of coaxial cable, you'll delay your signal by two microseconds. And that works. That's what he did. So you put a big roll of coaxial cable at a shallow depth. This will couple with the antenna, strong signal. The coaxial cable is mostly lossless. So you introduce this two microsecond delay, send back the signal, and you introduce your two microseconds. That works. But you have to put a roll of something like 100 meter of coaxial cable, which is hardly a compact sensor. Which is where we come in with our acoustic transducers. So that's the idea. The basic idea is the losses of clutter of all the environmental uh, reflectors decays as the fourth power of distance. So at some point, your signal will go below the receiver noise level. So what you would like is to find a design that will allow you to delay the sensor signal beyond the clutter response. And if you have a sensor measurement that is beyond the clutter, then you're sure that you are uh, detecting the sensor and with excellent signal to noise ratio because you have little response from all these devices. So how can we delay? One approach is what Christopher Allen did, put a big piece of cable and you just delay by the time of flight of the signal uh, along this delay line. So you artificially delay this shallow delay line uh, by a duration that is beyond uh, the, the, the weakest signal that you can detect. Or the second approach, and I'll show you why we went for the second approach, is to load a resonator. Because if you load energy in a resonator, you know that the quality factor, by definition, is the stored energy divided by the energy lost per period. 
So when you load energy in a resonator, the resonator will not instantaneously release all its energy, but because it's got a quality factor, it will slowly decay. And the decay time is an exponential of minus T over tau, which tau, the time constant of a resonator decay, which is Q over pi, uh, pi F, F, the resonance frequency, Q, the quality factor. So the larger the quality factor, the longer the resonator will take to decay uh, and to slowly release its energy uh, over the uh, free space perturbation loss. So unless you're in a resonant cavity or unless you're in an oven, which is a high quality factor cavity, your resonator will decay much slower, much slower than the environment uh, of the clutter. So the problem with this approach is that you need to find a way either to introduce some sort of delay or to introduce some sort of resonant decay. So I just want to uh, emphasize that historically, Stockman, Teremin, all these guys were doing linear behaviors. And then at some point, someone invented the diode. And when they invented the diode, they wanted to go back to what they knew, which were microcontroller uh, powering, and they want for rectifiers. Now, the reason why these devices are less efficient than linear systems is that you need to reach the rectifier threshold voltage to make it efficient. And the benefit of this system is that you can use an identifier with multiple bits. You've got all the intelligence of uh, silicon devices, but you need to reach the rectifier uh, threshold voltage. Furthermore, your backscatter signal will be a modulation of the impedance of the antenna meaning that the backscatter signal will be rather weak, hence the need to get close to the transmitter to get a relevant signal. In the case of resonators, if you make a dielectric resonator or a cavity resonator, you will have quality factors, say, in the hundreds at the best. And if you look at the time constant of a Q factor of 100, where you will hardly differentiate your sensor response from the uh, environment, from clutter. So this chipless RFID, I believe, will be the topic of the next presentation. Uh, so I will not get into the details of this topic here, but our objective in our far field through passive wireless sensor measurement design is to have a decay that is slow enough that energy is found after all the clutter has died out. And this is how we reach piezoelectric substrate. If we convert electromagnetic energy into acoustic energy using uh, inverse piezoelectric effect, which converts an incoming radio frequency wave into a mechanical wave, we benefit, first of all, from the very low losses of piezoelectric substrate. Typically, the Q factor, the quality factor of quartz devices at 500 megahertz will be in the 10,000 range. So 10,000 at 500 megahertz. I'm not sure I have ever seen an inductor with a Q factor higher than 100 at 500 megahertz. So that's the first reason. Low losses meet high quality factor at radio frequency devices. Secondly, an acoustic wave propagates typically in the 3000 meter per second region. An electromagnetic wave propagates at 300 meter per microsecond. There is a ratio of 10 to the 5 between the electromagnetic wave and the acoustic wave. This means that all the dimensions will be shrunk by a factor of 10 to the 5. So the 100 meters of coaxial cable of Christopher Allen has shrunk to about a millimeter long acoustic device. So these are the two benefits of going to piezoelectric substrate. A piezoelectric substrate will have a low loss and will shrink the device dimension. So what is this acoustic device made of? I'll show you some pictures later. From a clean room processing, it's extremely simple, nothing as complex as an integrated circuit. A piezoelectric uh, surface acoustic wave device is just a pattern of electrodes de deposited uh, patterned on the piezoelectric substrate. We take the substrate wafers, we pattern these electrodes uh, interdigitated transducer, and these will be powered by the radio frequency source connected to the antenna, generating the acoustic wave in both directions because there is no reason for the acoustic wave to go in only, only one direction. And these acoustic waves, these mechanical waves, are propagating 10 to the 5 times slower than the electromagnetic wave. And yet, they are radio frequency waves, so that means they are still 500 megahertz devices. So once we know how to generate the acoustic waves, we need to find a way of creating a sensor. And this is where we have two uh, great architectures that will be selected depending on the radar architecture. The first most intuitive one is the delay line. If you have um, a pulse coming onto this antenna, the transducer here will convert this electromagnetic wave into mechanical wave, acoustic waves, that will propagate 
on the substrate, on the positive substrate. And if this propagating acoustic wave meets some reflectors, and reflectors are just more uh, electrodes patterned on the substrate, they will be sent back. And if you wisely select the spacing between all these electrodes, which is what, what is called a Bragg mirror, if you put the spacing as a half wavelength, the energy will be back, will be sent back to the transducer uh, coherently, and you will accumulate energy coming back into your delay line. So you generate acoustic waves, you propagate these acoustic waves on the substrate. If you put different distances between these mirrors and the IDT, the inter interdigitated transducer, you will have different delays. And by direct piezoelectric effect, the incoming acoustic wave is converted back into an electromagnetic wave that is radiated towards the radar system. So that's the most intuitive delay line. And again, remember, because we're only at 3,000 meters per second, one millimeter here will create two microsecond delay, which would have needed otherwise 100 meters of coaxial cable. So that's the first thing, the delay line. The second one is the resonator. And for the resonator, what you want is the energy generated by the interdigitated transducer to be confined into this acoustic cavity. And to make a cavity, exactly like in optics, you put two mirrors. And these two mirrors, similarly to here, are electrodes, but enough electrodes to try to reflect back 99.999% of the energy. And if you do this, it means you've made a quality factor of a thousand because at every uh, time the signal bounces back and forth over the transducer here, we have a very high efficient uh, reflection coefficient and only a tiny fraction of the energy is radiated back. So that's the definition of a quality factor. And because your positive substrate is a very low loss substrate, you will have a high quality factor in this device, which means that we can achieve the objective. So there are demonstrations that the losses here are both intrinsic acoustic losses and uh, ohmic losses in the, in the electrodes here. So we've got broad ranges of positive materials, weakly coupled materials, which have a poor conversion efficiency between electromagnetic and acoustic waves. But these weakly coupled material have very low lo losses, typically quartz. So they will be well suited for the resonator design. On the other hand, we have some strongly coupled materials, such as lithium, tant lithium tantalate, uh, lithium niobate, which have very strong coupling, but strong coupling means high current, high ohmic losses. And these, dev these materials will be very suited for the delay, delay line uh, architecture. So that's basically the idea. Try to introduce some signature that we differentiate the backsider signal from the clutter using piezoelectric devices, because piezoelectric devices will shrink the device dimension, will allow us to have some resonator with high quality factor. And because piezoelectric devices are anisotropic materials, we have the freedom of selecting uh, strongly uh, dependent uh, on uh, temperature, on strain, on whatever quantity we want to look at. So if you look at the response of these devices, this is the resonator response. In the frequency domain, you only have one resonance. And if you look in the time domain, inverse Fourier transform, you have this slowly decaying energy from the resonator that would be your signal that you observe in the time domain. In the frequency domain, a delay line is not an obvious response because you've got all these backscatter signals from all these reflectors that overlap incoherently. So in the frequency domain, it's not completely obvious, but if you take the inverse Fourier transform of a frequency domain response, you get your eight and the eight echoes, the eights of the delay line, which are all these uh, reflected signals that you would detect with a delay that is longer. Here you have all the clutter in the first microsecond. This is five microsecond total delay. The clutter will be over here. You want clutter to fade out, and this is a sensor response between one and uh, three micro and two microseconds. So that's the basic, basic outline. So this is what the uh, positive device looks like. This is typically something like uh, a six millimeter by 10 millimeter, uh, 100 megahertz uh, acoustic transducer that I would be using for uh, ground penetrating radar measurements. This is the same stuff at 2.4 gigahertz. At 2.4 gigahertz, your wavelength uh, shrinks to a 1.2 micrometer wavelength, uh, acoustic wavelength, of course, so not 12 centimeter electromagnetic wavelength. And this 1.2 micrometer wavelength means the electrodes here has to be 300 nanometer wide, separated by 300 nanometer. Now, state-of-the-art clean room facilities will do this. That's typically the kind of uh, uh, acoustic filters that you would have in your mobile phone. 
uh, we use this kind of technology for making these tags. So this is a delay line. You can hardly see here one mirror, another mirror, a third mirror over here. And at 100 megahertz, that's really trivial um, clean room uh, fabrication facility. You've got five micrometer uh, wide electrode separated by five mic micrometers. That's much easier to fabricate. So once we've decided what is the substrate, what is the geometry of the electrodes, and what is the operating frequency from the period of the, the, the period of the interdigitation transducer, we end up deciding what is the sensing capability. With the electrodes, I answered the fir first question, which is how to introduce some sort of signature. With the second question I wish to answer now is, how can I uh, have a sensor and not just a tag? And these are anisotropic material, so depending on the uh, direction of propagation of the acoustic wave, I can select temperature compensated, so little de dependence with temperature, or temperature dependent propagation speed. And these are typically the calibration curve that I would do for Senseor. So you have here a temperature compensated cut that has little temperature dependence over temperature. You have a strong dependence uh, a strong temperature dependence over here. And if you subtract these two responses, you've got a one-to-one -one relationship between the physical quantity you wish to measure, temperature in this case, and frequency. Of course, with our radar system, we will be measuring frequency and we identify temperature by calibrating first this dependence. This is valid for temperature. We did the same for stress, for pressure, or for chemical sensing. So now we have the answer to our objective. The first thing we might want to do is a delay line by putting mirrors far enough that they suppress all the clutter response after this delay, and we make sure that only the delay line can have a response over here, or we can uh, look at the slowly decaying signal from a resonator that has been loaded with two trade-offs. Either we start with a high coupling coefficient, a, a strong backscatter signal, but it's been demonstrated that high coupling coefficients mean rather low quality factor, so this means a quickly decaying signal, or a lower uh, coupling coefficient, but a high quality factor that will uh, keep energy for much longer. So these are the two strategies. So to give you a few demonstrations of what we actually did with these, this sensor that I showed you earlier, we use it for ground penetrating radar. So in this example, we want to detect pollutant in the subsurface. So this is a project with Total, an uh, oil company, and we want to detect pollutant in, the, uh, in, the, in their uh, wells. So the, first, the two objectives are hydrogen sulfide, which is a byproduct of uh, oil extraction uh, when a bacteria contaminate a well. And the second one is toluene and benzene detection. So in this case, what you do is you put your strongly coupled substrate um, and you coat it with a, a sensitive, a sensitive uh, substrate, as you know very well over here. And in this case, what we did is we put a lead-loaded uh, material. Lead is known to react with sulfur. So the polymer here will be broken upon exposure to hydrogen sulfide, going from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. And if we expose the sensor to water, and there is always water in the ground table in the subsurface, then your water will soak the polymer and you have a very strong signal because your hydrophobic layer has become hydrophilic and you increase the, uh, the density, meaning you slow down the velocity. Similarly, you can also create some uh, nanoparticles. You can stiffen the layer. And if you stiffen the, uh, the, uh, the layer over here, you will accelerate, you will increase the velocity by increasing the U modulus, and you can accelerate the speed at which the electromagnetic wave, uh, acoustic wave propagates. So what you're going to see here is varying time delays. Actually, time delay is measured as a phase. And what you're looking at is mass loading if, if a phase decays uh, or stiffening if a phase increases. So you actually come back to some sort of physical uh, interaction between the compound to be detected and, and, the, and the thin film that you deposit on, on the layer. So chemical sensing is one demonstration. This is a demonstration of temperature sensing that I did at the uh, Sato Laboratory in Sendai. Just to show you that you can actually do measurements just with a basic network analyzer because you, a, a delay line is basically for echoes in this example, but time domain echoes are just the inverse Fourier transform of frequency domain characterization. So you take your network analyzer, frequency step continuous wave measurement, take the inverse Fourier transform of the S21 parameter. This is a bistatic radar measurement. And by taking the inverse Fourier transform, we recover the four echoes. In this case, what I had done, I had put some uh, resistor next to the sensor, which is over here. This is my sensing element. I had put a resistor 
and I was heating the sensor and cooling down the sensor. Uh, this is a temperature measurement after calibration by using the temperature sensitivity of it now bed. And what I would like to emphasize here is I plotted the return power. And what you see here is when you do some sensing measurement, your return power remains mostly the same. This is very important to me because in a lot of publications, you will see that you have sensing capability, but when you start sensing, your return power drops. Typically, you would short circuit the antennas. Good, by short circuiting the antenna, you have sensing capability, but if you short circuit the antenna, you're not sending anything back to the network analyzer and you don't have any signal uh, going back to the, to the system. So that's very important to me. Acoustic transducer will exhibit some strong uh, velocity change upon uh, change of uh, temperature, stress, or chemical compound binding, but the acoustic energy uh, propagating will hardly change, meaning that the signal return to the radar will not be dependent on the quantity being uh, observed. And, and that's a very important capability of, of these sensors. Finally, a couple of uh, industrial applications. This was uh, rotor monitoring uh, for Alstom. Alstom wanted us to measure their um, electrical motor temperature. This on purpose is, uh, of course, a defective motor. And usually your motor in your uh, high-speed train will not go to, to such high temperatures. This one, uh, the bearing were on purpose damaged. And here we have a stator with its antenna. The rotor is here with uh, the sensor located at this location here. And what you see, we did some measurements at 500 RPM all the way to 4,000 RPM. And the temperature was rising. We could have constantly the measurements as the sensor was rotating on the uh, on this part, on the outer part. And the, of course, antenna connected to the reader system was static. This is an example for Michelin. Uh, Michelin asked us to put some sensors in the tire because, of course, if you put sensors inside the tire, uh, you don't want to have to cut the tire to change the battery. So the objective of Michelin was to try to uh, instrument uh, their tires to measure temperature. In this case, it's uh, Formula One uh, tires. They need to tune finely the temperature of the tires to uh, adhere best to the road. And so you see here, you've got the uh, central part of the tire. You've got the side bands of the tire as the, uh, uh, as the tire is, is uh, rotating when the uh, car is driving. And here you've got the temperature uh, linear drive or uh, simulating the, uh, the turn. And you see the various sensors rising in temperature as there is shear stress in the, in the tire. Originally, this project was aimed at detecting loss of adherence when your uh, car starts slipping. They wanted to detect uh, loss of strain due to the uh, sensor losing adherence. Uh, that was the reason why they wanted to put sensors inside the tire. So you see here, we went again to something like uh, 200 kilometers per hour, and we could easily uh, detect the sensor uh, in, buried in the tire that was rotating on the wheel. So finally, a sensor is useless if you do not have a readout system. You need to have the readout electronics to measure the sensor. So this is the system that we had designed and we were selling with Sensor. Now Sensor stopped selling this system by doing something else. So in this demonstration, we had some sensor inside concrete. We were measuring uh, temperature, sensor temperature as the concrete was hardening. And we did all the strategies. So basically, cooperative targets, work with uh, fast sampling uh, using pulse radar. They will work with frequency step continuous wave, that's a network analyzer. They will work with FMCW, beat signal. You can use all the classical methods in a delay line interrogation, just taking the inverse Fourier transform if you do a frequency domain characterization. Uh, or if you have a resonator, that's for delay line measurement, or if you have a resonator, you would just pro pro either take the Fourier transform or as a network analyzer would do a frequency swept network analyzer. What's important here is that if you want to go beyond the laboratory, if you want to have some industrial application for the sensor, you need to meet regulations. In the lab, you can do whatever you want. If you want to sell these devices, you need to meet regulations. Regulations tell you industrial, scientific, and medical bands are the only place where you're allowed to send energy without paying a fee or without asking for authorization. The two ISM bands, I'm forgetting about the 14 megahertz, 1356, which is too low, the antenna are too big. You cannot do anything at 1356 megahertz, at least compact for far field measurements. So the, the two frequency bands I'm interested in are the 444 megahertz ISM band and the 2.4 gigahertz, right? So Wi-Fi, the Bluetooth, all the digital communication. 5.8 gigahertz is already too high for acoustic. Acoustic transducer, I told you 2.4 gigahertz is already 300 nanometer. Above this, you have two small electrodes for acoustic devices. 
24 gigahertz is completely out of range for acoustic transducer. So for acoustic transducer, we have 444 and 2.4 gigahertz. Now what you see is the 2.4 gigahertz is quite wide and is well suited for delay line measurement because 8 megahertz is inverse of 12.5 uh, nanoseconds. So if you have pulses that are 12 nanoseconds, you can put a lot of echoes in the one microsecond uh, time delay introduced by the acoustic uh, transducer. Whereas in the 444 megahertz, you would be hard pressed to put any uh, wideband signal because you've only got 1.7 megahertz broadband signal. So you, you will have this very slow decay of the signal over one microsecond to meet the regulation and you cannot put delay lines in such a narrow band. Whereas putting a resonator at such a high frequency means you have a low quality factor and Q over pi F because F, F has been raised by a factor of six, six means that you have a, a very short delay. So the 2.4 gigahertz is well suited for delay lines. The 444 megahertz ISM band is well suited for resonators. Hence the adaptation of the electronic circuit to these frequencies. So usually I would go now into the demonstration of all the radar architectures. First of all, I'm sure that you're very familiar with radar architectures. And secondly, I don't have the time to get into the details of all these implementations. We can discuss them later if you wish. But I wanted to show you one funny application I have, and that's what I learned in Sendai. It's called passive bi-static radar. In PBR, in passive bi-static radar, you're not emitting your self energy, you're using a uh, smog of electromagnetic waves. So you're using all these electromagnetic save waves we have around us. So say you have an emitter here, a non-cooperative emitter, usually a very powerful emitter, a military radar, DVB-T transmitter, FM station, one of the very strong kilowatt range emitters. And what you want is to detect a target. Now, usually people doing digital communication, they call this multipath. We, in radar, pass, the radar system, we call this a target. So multipath for people doing digital communication means that the signal coming to the receiver here will interfere with any uh, reflection on the environment. And if you can measure the Doppler shift or the time delay between the direct wave and the one reflected by the target, you can actually recover the uh, target properties. So you do some Doppler uh, analysis and you have the speed of the target, you do some time delay between the reference measurement and the surveillance measurement, and you have a range of target. Now, this is pop very popular at the moment with military applications because, first of all, you're not radiating, meaning that you have a passive radar. So usually the first thing you do is you will launch a missile at any radio frequency source. Here, if you're using the enemy's uh, propagation medium, television, radio, you, they will not destroy their own emitters, so you can use someone else's emitter as their radar source. And what you would do here, and secondly, this is very well suited for bi-static measurements, meaning that you have multiple antennas, and the hypothesis underlying stealth aircraft or stealth boats, ships, is that uh, it's a monostatic radar. All these flat surfaces assume that you have a flat surface. So in a multi-static radar, the stealth aircraft and stealth ships are working very poorly. So multi-static plus passive radar make this very popular at the moment. And we did this using software-defined radio, which is uh, trying to put as much intelligence in software and putting as little as we could in the radio frequency la uh, layer. So what we're doing here is we have a dual frequency receiver that digitizes as fast as it can the two channels, a surveillance channel looking at target, a reference channel looking at the emitter, because you need to know, you don't know what the emitter is sending. If you have a TV tower, the TV tower is sending a wave whose properties are not known. And so by observing the emitter, you will be able to with the copies of the surveillance over here. And when the correlation is maximized, you know what is the speed of a target and the range. It's quite computationally intensive. So I learned to do this in Sendai. We did this on boats, we did this on planes. It works very well, it's well known. And what I wanted to do here was to add whether I could detect a corporate target using this system. And the frameworks I wanted to do this in was all cities nowadays are illuminated by TV towers. All major cities have a 20 to 100 kilowatts. In Paris, it's 50 kilowatts. In Besançon, it's 20 kilowatts. So you've got these high power emitters illuminating all cities nowadays. And the hypothesis was, the scenario I wanted to look at is whether I could instrument walls of buildings with my passive cooperative targets. So typically a wall would be something like 15 centimeter thick. 
So what I'm looking at is interrogation range in the tens of centimeters. Say you have a TV tower, the TV tower is illuminating the wall, the sensor inside the wall is illuminated by the radio frequency wave, and I would come with my radar and try to detect the signal backscattered from the wall to measure stress, to measure pollutant, to measure this kind of stuff. So that's, that's the objective. Can we make a so delay line as a cooperative target for non-cooperative sources, passive by static radar measurements? And the answer is, of course, yes, otherwise I wouldn't be here. And uh, that's the design of the delay line. So what you need to do is, because we've got a lot of degrees of freedom in designing these delay lines, we can tune the center frequency, we can tune the bandwidth. The, the center frequency is given by the spacing between the electrodes. The bandwidth here is given by the number of electrodes that we put on the reflectors. So we've got a lot of degrees of freedom in tuning these sensors. So what we did here is we looked a little bit at the spectra of the TV stations in Besançon, in Clermont-Ferrand, where I was spending my vacation in Paris. Uh, so we were looking at what are the spectra transmitted by the TV towers and matching these emitted spectra with the transfer function of the delay line. This is the frequency domain, so this must match the properties of the delay line of, of the transmitted signal. And this is the time domain, inverse Fourier transform, with the three echoes, echo one, echo two, and echo three. And the time delay between these echoes will allow us to recover the physical quantity. And here is a demonstration. So for example, in this, uh, so we take here a, a strongly coupled material. So that's 128 meter niobate with its six person coupling coefficient. And what you can demonstrate is that the bandwidth of uh, the operating bandwidth of an uh, acoustic transducer, the bandwidth over here is equal to the center frequency divided by the coupling coefficient, K squared. So if you have a six person coupling, it means that at 550 megahertz, you will have a 31 megahertz bandwidth. You might know that television is broadcasting eight megahertz wide signal, which is narrower than what we have here. But no one said you had to use only one TV station. Here, Puy-Dô is emitting all these radio frequency waves. And what we did is we selected three adjacent channels as the signal that will be analyzed. So from something like 520 to 540, these are three adjacent channels broadcast by Pido over here. And we have two antennas, one antenna looking at the reference signal, a second antenna with a sensor here, and my radio, my software defined radio looking at the direct wave and looking at the reflected signal. So that, that's what we're looking for. And when you do the analysis, so the distance between the location where this is measured and the pre dome emitter over here is 12 kilometers. And what I'm doing here is I'm measuring the echo coming back from my sensor. So remember, I assume here you would have something like a concrete wall, which I simulate with this bench. And here is the first echo, second echo, third echo, which are the three echoes that we had over here. First echo, second echo, third echo are the response of my delay line. And this is the return power. So you see that up to something like 15 centimeter, I have no echo, which is my background noise. And these are the three echoes that come out of clutter because I've delayed them beyond the clutter. So this requires a bit of processing because again, you need to get rid of a direct wave. This surveillance antenna is illuminated by the direct wave coming from the TV tower. So you need to get rid of this direct signal interference. There's a bit of uh, computation involved here, but once you get rid of a direct wave, you can extract the signal uh, that is backscattered from the sensor over here towards the uh, uh, surveillance antenna. And once you've done this, well, again, it's a sensor, so the time delay is dependent on the temperature. What I did here is I put a lighter and I heated up the sensor using a lighter. I did the measurement twice. So first time, baseline. So this is a time delay. Uh, time delay is a function of time. I switch on the lighter, so I heat up the sensor. You see the time delay rising. I stop. And then I hit again, and you've got the uh, second temperature rise. I repeated the measurement multiple times. You get uh, the repeated pattern of the heating of the sensor when you switch on the lighter and you heat up the sensor. I did the same in Paris because it happens that uh, the Eiffel Tower is transmitting at uh, very nearby frequencies. You saw earlier uh, Clermont-Ferrand is transmitting between 520 and 540, except that in Paris they have this experimental band where they send um, a 50 kilowatt on most uh, transmitters, except they have this high uh, bandwidth, high resolution TV, which only transmits five kilowatts. So when we're over here uh, at the summit of, TV, of a TV tower, 
you've got all these stations being broadcast. Again, we eliminate the sensor. And uh, because you will have somewhat a weaker signal with a five kilowatt, we have a bit less of a range. It's only four kilometers away. But again, you see that as we switch on the lighter, we heat up, uh, we heat up the sensor located over here, and we can detect the temperature from the backside signal at a range of 10 to 15 centimeters. So that, that's a demonstration. So to conclude and to relate a little bit to the work that's being done in, in this lab, how does it relate with energy harvesting? Uh, my reference uh, for energy harvesting, because, well, uh, I'm a bit outdated, but I, I was quite fascinated by the work that had been done at, uh, at Tokyo University at Hongo Campus. Hongo Campus is located about five kilometers from Tokyo Tower. The Japanese are much more conservative than Western Europe about transmitted power. They have only a few kilowatts. And yet, uh, the authors at uh, Tokyo University managed to power some of these low power microprocessors, the TI MSP430 or the PIC, uh, microchip PIC microprocessor, by uh, loading a supercap uh, with a rectified signal at a distance of uh, six kilometers from uh, between Tokyo Tower and uh, Hongo Campus. So if you look at the, um, at the, at the power that they cite in their paper over here, uh, you integrate, again, as I did, they take multiple TV tower, TV channels, and they integrate with minus 37 dBm that is transmitted on each one of the, uh, of the channels. They integrate this to minus 9 dBm. If you look at the link budget, so they have to accumulate quite a lot of energy to reach the threshold voltage where the microprocessor can start working and send back an information. So they need to load for about 60 seconds because before they can send a measurement. Uh, if you look at the comparison, in this case, they need to accumulate quite a lot of energy and they need to wait for quite a long time to reach the threshold voltage. If I do the same calculation on my measurement over here at 12 kilometers, the free space propagation loss tells you that you only have 31, minus 31 dBm in the channel that I'm collecting. And due to the acoustic losses of a surface acoustic wave transducer, the receiver will actually get something like minus 50 dBm uh, radio frequency. So the benefit here is that we can have longer range. The drawback uh, is that we have a backseller signal that decays as the fourth power of distance, whereas here these uh, microcontrollers appear as sources by themselves. So they will transmit a signal that only decays as the square of the distance with a receiver. So they have longer uh, communication range than we do with backseller signal but they need to load energy much longer than what we can do with the cross-correlation to reach the signal out of the noise when we do the correlations. So that tries to relate a little bit what we're doing with acoustic transducer over electromagnetic harvesting uh, and, and Euro's work on, on the, these uh, rectifiers. So to conclude, I wanted to introduce to this audience the use of uh, passive cooperative targets as wireless sensors uh, in order to introduce the signature that differentiates the return signal from clutter. I wanted to add sensing capability either by uh, using uh, the uh, intrinsic properties of the material. I didn't discuss here extrinsic properties by putting external transducer. Uh, we do this by using acoustic transducer uh, sub uh, 2.4 gigahertz frequency range. When we will go above 2.4 gigahertz, we need to go for dielectric resonators. We did it as well, but it's out of topic, off topic of this presentation. Um, I think it's very important to have a systems approach where the transducer matches the radio frequency electronic, matches the uh, signal processing that you're doing. And here is a demonstration. This is the sandbox we have in uh, the, the parking lot of our lab where we do ground plate radio radar, we can introduce sensors at various depths. You see here the backscatter signal from the sensors located from 20 centimeters down to 100 uh, centimeters. I cannot go any lower because the uh, deepest part of the swing. And still you have a very strong backscatter signal all the way to, 100, uh, to one meter depth when you interrogate the system using a commercially available ground plane tracking radar. So in this measurement, we you sweep the ground plane tracking radar along the position over the gravel over here. And when you're right over the sensor, you get a signal. And this is a cross section of the signal that you receive over here. So that concludes my presentation. If you wish to have more uh, information, this part actually is in French. But uh, there is uh, one presentation in Technique de l'Ingénieur that we wrote with my former boss, Sylvain Balandras, and a few additional references if you're interested. And with that, I thank you for your attention if there's any question. So I think we may have uh, time for a few questions. Uh, 
Do you have any online question? Yeah. Can the system disturb by electromagnetic wave constantly from other devices? We are extremely sensitive to interferences because we, our rear system will send a pulse, assume that the clutter fades out after, say, one microsecond, and uh, if an other source of electromagnetic waves is radiating, our receiver will be overwhelmed by this electromagnetic wave because all these electromagnetic waves are transmitted at uh, 1 over d squared, whereas our signal is displaying as 1 over the fourth power. So this was a huge problem because when we're working at 444 megahertz, a lot of digital communication systems are communicating at 444 megahertz. In the case of Senseor, we were reading the system, uh, the sensor response in 10 milliseconds. So what we would do is repeat the measurement fast enough and throw away all the uh, unwanted measurements. So uh, to answer the question, the reason why we have uh, in the Michelin measurement here, all these, so on top here, you've got the raw measurements and that includes all the radio modem, all the unwanted interferences from digital communication systems. And what I would do is actually filter out, take the mean value of the quantity because we know that the temperature is not jumping by tens of degrees from one measurement to another. And this is a cleaned out signal. So the short answer is yes, we're extremely dependent and extremely sensitive to interferences from uh, other emitters, yes. As are all radars, actually. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, please. Uh, what, uh, could you give me an example of the power that you use for ground penetrating radars? Transmitting power. Ground penetrating radar is a very funny field. Um, the short answer is you polarize uh, avalanche transistor with something like 200 volts, and the pulse you send is something like 80 volts. So if you put 80 volts in 50 ohm, that's one kilowatt peak power. But it's a pulse radar. So the mean power, uh, typically you will send a pulse which lasts about 10 nanoseconds, and you transmit it once every 10 microseconds. So you have a duty cycle of 1,000. So your peak power of about two kilowatt means your mean power is about two watts. And surprisingly enough, uh, this is allowed. Uh, there is actually no regulation. It's called an ultra wideband system. And because you're coupling your electromagnetic energy towards the ground, at the moment, there is no regulation preventing. There, there is a lot of discussion trying to uh, regulate uh, ground penetrating radar. There is so many uses. I mean, this is used in civil engineering, mostly whenever you're building a new road, when you're searching for pipes. So it, regulating these devices would be very difficult, considering all the applications that are now available. But uh, it's a huge power with respect to what other people are allowed to do. But yet, this power is sent mostly into the ground. If you look at this uh, example of this ground penetrating radar from an analysis system for the Swedish company, actually it's called a shielded antenna. And in urban environments, here you have absorbing electromagnetic absorbing material, meaning that all the energy is coupled here where you have the strongest capacitance. And furthermore, you have very little energy that is being radiated towards the air because also we don't want, this is working at 100 megahertz, meaning that FM bands are very strongly disturbing. When I'm doing radar measurements, I have to switch off VHF radio because it would just disturb the VHF radio. So this will be extremely disturbed by FM radio. But thanks to the shielding, we have little disturbance and we're sending most of the energy. So we have one, ki one to two kilowatt peak power, something like two watt mean power, and only a few milliwatt radiated towards the air. So this means that this can still be used under regulations. Do we have any questions? You are doing uh, this um, uh, time domain analysis um, after doing uh, an inverse Fourier transform of your uh, S parameter. Um, in the case you would not have so much uh, computing power, uh, could you not just do some uh, frequency analysis? I mean, uh, what you have, I see you have these multiple peaks uh, in the frequency domain. So you just need to look at the, um, the frequency change uh, between the interferences. So if we want to go for time domain delay lines, either we use a pulse approach where we directly get the time domain, but it needs a fast sampling like an FPGA, so that's power hungry. 
or the advantage of frequency sweep and taking the inverse Fourier transform is that uh, you can have a, a, a well-determined transmitted signal and still recover a wide bandwidth with a very slow electronics because you're measuring each frequency one after the other. In the case of Sensor, we were measuring resonance frequency. Competition was using a broadband pulse and taking the, inver the Fourier transform of a return signal which we claim to be inefficient because first of all, you were spreading energy in a lot of frequency that were not coupled to the resonator and they needed two DSP actually uh, to go fast enough. So what we did in our reader is we used a somewhat more intelligent source, which is a direct digital synthesizer to sweep the, tar the emitted frequency and the receiver, actually we didn't need any Fourier transform because we knew exactly which frequency was transmitted and the receiver was just a rectifier, so a power detector that would feed the A to D converter. So here we only had a small ARM7 microcontroller programming the DDS. The direct digital synthesizer would take about 10 milliseconds to sweep a full frequency range. And for each frequency, we would just be reading the, uh, the uh, return power, which is a very simple electronics, uh, and no computation at all. We just would look at the maximum of return power. And I believe you would have much better dynamic range because uh, you are not in integrating. Exactly. So, so we, we the, 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 the main drawback of this approach is that we are not integrating over the transmitted signal, but you're inter here we have only a power detector. So we had a, a bandpass filter and we were measuring all the return power. And to answer the previous question, it means that on the receiver side, we would integrate the whole 434 ISM band. So anyone talking in the ISM band would not be filtered out by our power detector. If you take a Fourier transform, you can select which frequency you're looking for, and you can throw away all the interference from an uh, unwanted transmitter. In our case, our receiver was so simple, it was just a power detector with a bandpass filter that we would be very easily uh, interfered or uh, uh, prevented from measuring by other uh, communication systems. Okay, yeah, that's very nice. So let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and uh, again, congratulations for this great event. And Nicolas, maybe? <laughs>